All right, can I uh, get everybody's attention? Um, I want to introduce our speaker today, and also uh, I have the sign-in sheet, which is floating around. I appreciate if everybody can sign in, to just have some record of, uh, you know, people actually did show up. And um, also, uh, for the undergraduate students, uh, most of you guys I got the, uh, your papers from. Uh, if I get it, then I'll collect that after. Uh, I wanted to introduce our speaker today. This is uh, Everett uh, Richards from Lee College. Um, you know, we are, we met him, uh, I think we, uh, myself and some of the other some faculty here, met him at a community college luncheon that we had, uh, I think it was like last spring. And uh, so it was almost a year ago. And what happened was uh, we talked. He, uh, he's been teaching physics at Lee College. Before that, he uh, got his bachelor's from Texas A&M, a master's, uh, or two different masters, one from UT Dallas and one from Georgia Tech, and then a PhD from North Carolina State University. And what he did was he specialized in uh, physics education research, or PER, as they refer to it. And it's particularly important to us because we're getting ready to do something different, which is actually to start teaching introdu more introductory freshman level physics on our campus. So Evan has also been sort of our advisor for that, and he's helped us with um, information on how do we plan and how do we um, start designing the classes. And so um, he's a very good person to know on those issues. And so I invited him here today to talk a little bit about um, what it is they do and the physics education research. And it's not just simply teaching the class. Physics, of course, teaching it is not as easy as that. If it was as easy as just showing up in a class and just um, you know, lecturing, then over 90% of the people would fail. So what he's doing is he's trying to get it the other way around so that something like 90% of the people are hopefully going to pass. So I'll turn over to Evan. Thank you very much. Uh, so, with a lot of people hear about the fact that I came out of physics education research, most people imagine, wait a minute, he's got a physics PhD, but he's in physics education research. Should he be in the education department, right? And later on in the talk, as we go, I'm going to talk about why we want physicists leading the charge in PER, as opposed to someone else. It's uh, very important that we stay at the forefront of this movement that has been growing over many years now. And so tonight, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the human cognition and neuroscience results that feed into PER, because in many ways, PER is an intersection of several different fields. Yes, I'm a physicist, but as it turns out, I've had training in a variety of other areas as part of my background. And in fact, as David mentioned, I'm now taking the scenic route. I started out as an engineer, became a physicist later on, and now, of course, I'm teaching at Lee College. So uh, I have definitely taken the scenic route to get here. It's a bit of fun. I would trade it in for anything else. So the idea is behind neuroscience. Why, are we, why do we care about it? Why do we care about human cognition? Well, the thing is, if we can understand how the human brain works, in particular, how it processes information, or in our case, how it processes physics, related information, we can affect our students' learning, either in a positive or hopefully not a negative way, right? And so tonight I'm going to talk a bit about some of the results that have come out of this branch of research. And then as we get towards the end of the talk, I'm going to tie it in with actual instruction, things that I do in my own classroom, things that you might consider for yours, either you're teaching now or perhaps down the road. Uh, things that you might think about as we go. And so let me give you an example of what we've learned out of the neuroscience research. Uh, because if you understand how the human brain processes information, oh, you can play with a person's perception. And it's kind of a creepy idea, but it's true. If I understand how your mind perceives the world around it, oh, I can manipulate it. As an example, let me show you this figure right here. Now on here you'll see two tiles that are labeled A and B right there. Now as you're looking at it, pay close attention to what shade of gray they are. 
they look a bit different, don't they? But would you believe that they're really not that different? They're actually the exact same shape. How would I do that? The thing is, your mind has certain preconceptions in it, the way it processes the world around it. Your mind, based on experience, knows about shape. It understands what things should look like in a shadow and what they should not look like in a shadow. And so the way your mind is processing this image is based upon the shadow that it sees in there. And yes, there's the same shade of gray. There's the absolute same shade of gray. And knowing how your mind processes this image, I can change your perception quite easily. Let me give you some more examples of this. Yet another one. Where you get to see again two different tiles. Notice how you've got a tile here and a tile here. They are the same shape. And yet, by manipulating the shape of it, don't they look different after a bit? Just by a very simple change. A very simple change that modifies your perception of it. Again, playing it off what your mind knows to be true about shadow and effect. Now, where what about applications to the world of physics? Well, here's the thing. When your students walk into the classroom, they will have their own preconceptions about the world around them. They will have their own preconceptions about physics. In fact, what is surprising to a lot of students when they walk in is how much language plays into them. Because when they walk in with certain preconceptions, they think they know what speed is, what velocity is. Because these are words that people use in everyday language, yet when I as a physicist use those words, I have a very specific meaning of them. I have a very specific definition of those, which may not match what my students believe those words mean. And so when they walk into my room, it's important that I understand where they're at right now so that I can take them to where I want them to be later on. And this is where we begin to get into the realm of God. It's understanding these frequencies. Understanding these ideas that students walk into my room with. So that way I can begin to transition them over to well, a different mindset in many ways. One that I want them to leave my classroom with. Let me give you an example of this. One of the classic questions that is in physics, not just in PBR, you'll hear it in about every introductory exam class, is this one. Imagine a large truck hits head on with a small car. Worst possible place to go imagine, all right? It head on. And you ask them the question, well, compare the magnitude of the force that the truck does on the car versus how much the car pushes back, the magnitude of that force pushing back. And, of course, what is the gut reaction? So many students will say, well, of course the truck pushes harder, right? It has to. It's bigger. It must push harder. And yet, to a physicist, this is ridiculous. Using Newton's law, in fact, the third law in particular, we, of course, can identify the problem. And yet, to a student, this is perfectly In their mind, it's not that they're necessarily picturing the wrong thing. I mean, for us, it's pretty obvious a collision between a car and a truck. I don't care if you've never had a movie in your life. You could probably picture that, right? And so what's happening here? Well, in the end, the students know there is something different between the car and the truck. And I would agree. They are not identical. There is something different between them. But the problem is the students associate this with the magnitude of the force. But what is different? Well, one thing is their acceleration, right? They will have dramatically different accelerations. What else? Their mass. How much inertia they have. Those are some things that are different between the car and the truck. Yet the students are associating this idea of force with that, with this change of motion. They're saying, well, the forces are different sizes. You may disagree. So we agree on what's happening in terms of the big picture, but both probably an accident in our minds. It's just we're using a different language to describe. And so most students walk into my classroom and they're shocked at the fact that the language I, that so much of my class is about teaching them the language first before we can even get into the application. Because if we're not speaking the same language, huh? and so when students walk into my class. For example, from biology, they'll say, yeah, I expect to have to learn new words in biology, mitochondria, the various 
cells and the muscle groups and the bones in the body. I have to learn all those. But I'm in physics. I just have to learn the vocabulary here too. And I said, yeah. So what makes it even worse is the words I use are the same words that you use. They just don't necessarily line up in what they need. And so a lot of my class at the beginning at least is loaded with this communication idea of being able to talk with my students on the same plane as opposed to me over here and like me sitting over here and us talking at each other but not to each other. It's a big part of the introductory course. Let me give you, and so this example in many ways highlights why we need physicists at the forefront of the art because we understand the language. After all, after all, it's our language that we speak. We need physicists at the forefront of this because we have the big picture. Once you are finished with Newtonian mechanics, we know where it can lead you. Over here, you've got uh, Einstein's relativity. On the other side, you've got quantum mechanics. We understand the big picture. We know that, okay, I, in my e &M course, I just learned about green functions, but my gosh, in quantum mechanics, I've seen the propagator. Wow, so those two look kind of sort of similar to each other. And so we understand where this can lead you. That's why you want a physicist leading the charge here in CBR. We have the physics knowledge, we have the physics background, we know how to speak the language. And even more importantly, we understand what conceptions the students have coming in, and we understand what we want them when they leave. Right? The idea of CBR is to bridge that gap, to bring them from where they're at now to where we want them to be in the end. Let me show you another example about some of the results from the neuroscience field. To a famous video clip. Oh, it's well known. And at least for those in CPR. You may have seen it before. And if you have, all I ask is, don't spoil it for everybody else. It's a lot of fun. I promise. Now, this one's going to require a bit of participation on your part. Being a CPR, I've never been one of taught. I'd like to hear what you all do. So here's what you're going to see. In this video clip, you're going to see two teams of people. Half the people are wearing white jerseys, the other half are wearing black jerseys. Now, they're going to have basketball, and they're going to be passing basketballs back and forth to each other. Here's what I want you to do. Count up how many times that somebody in a white jersey passes to somebody else in a white jersey. Now, it's going to be chaotic, because there's one basketball, there's a whole bunch of them. All right? Now, focus very carefully on how many times somebody in a white jersey passed to somebody else in a white jersey. Here we go. All right. At the end, I'm going to ask you what, what you get. There, there will be a quiz at the end of this. All right. So how many times has somebody in white passed to somebody else in white? Here we go. Okay. You have a number? Can we count it up? 14? 13. Really 13? 14? Now, here's a dirty little secret. I really am not interested in how many times they pass. I have another question to ask you, but it's going to sound weird. It's going to sound like it came out of nowhere out of left field, but I promise you it's a legit question. How many of you saw the Moonwalking Bear? We got one, two. Yeah, not the majority of the folks. I'm going to play the same video clip to you. But this time, don't worry about counting. Just watch it. Just watch it. All right? Here we go. I'm going to rewind it. Exact same video clip. And watch it very carefully now. Don't worry about counting anything. Pretend you're just watching TV. Here we go. Watch for the moonwalking bear. I swear to you, it's the same video clip. Absolutely the same video clip. There we go. So we're off and rolling. And we're off and rolling. Give it a moment. And oh, there it is. <laughs> It's the same video clip. I promise I'm not playing the game with you. Yeah. You're Notice how I can direct your attention and we miss the obvious. Right? You're absolutely right. That's the secret behind this. I get you focused in another direction. Oh, it's a favorite tool from the fishing. Here's the thing. You know, they had to choose the cheesiest looking bear costume yeah. possible, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. So the thing is, is that if you can control perception, control information process, if you notice I was directing your mind elsewhere, and we missed the obvious thing. 
by the way, they did a follow-up study on this, where they brought the people who knew about the bear, right? They do, in fact, another clip, they use a gorilla too. Gorilla cheese is looking on too. And they said, okay, you guys have seen this before. In fact, every time in the future you see this clip again, you can't miss it now. It just stands out as well. So sorry, I've ruined Gianna for all time going forward. But the bottom line is they brought in people who already seen it. And they said, okay, we want you to watch the clip again. And everyone, oh, we know what the game is. And so, sure enough, they saw the moonwalking bear. I've seen no one else figure. They did some other stuff in the background. That was ridiculous. Oh, they didn't know it was that thing. Even though they were looking for it, they actually saw all of us right here. This could be some other place now. They didn't see it. They, they, they didn't see it at all. Simply by directing your attention, I can direct how you process information. Now, that's the real power of PDR. In fact, we're now, you know, you can actually use something like this. Oh, it's a little different. The principles are different. But one of the games I like to play in my own physics class, especially in my, in my second semester course, is something kind of related. You call it tangentially related. You may have seen this demo before, the wonderful vegetable in a beaker demo, right? So you put a small beaker inside a large one, and then you start pouring. And they pour it all the way to the top. And then what happens? Well, you say, okay, that's what you do. The beaker's a fun, right? And then, of course, you keep pouring oil into it. Now, here's the thing about vegetable oil and Pyrex glass. No, there are indices of refraction are pretty darn together. Common indices of refraction. Think about how the light is going to act as it goes through. But watch that. They're very careful. It starts to become very hard to see. By the way, I love doing this demo with actual equipment. In fact, I've got an activity in my class where they then explain that to me. I actually have them do something else that's somewhat related to this, and I say, okay, now that you've done this other activity, how does this apply over here? And they do a pretty good job of figuring it out. I'm awesome proud of them. And in the end, well, my students realize maybe the visibility isn't so crazy, right? It's a little harder to see the uh, speaker. So, yes, you can play similar games all based on different principles in the uh, world of physics. Okay. So, what am I talking about here? Well, what I'm getting to is PER is the science of teaching. You know, a lot of people get that confused with the art of teaching, but the art is a different world. Art is at one end of the spectrum and science is in the other. Let me give you an example of this. Imagine you're at a museum and you're looking at a picture. Let's say it's a painting. It's the most amazing painting you've ever seen. You're just blown away by it. You're looking at this going, my gosh, that's a Extraordinary. And your friend walks up and says, Oh, you have proof. It's an odd question to ask, isn't it? Right? Or this photograph, it really speaks to me. Okay, prove it. It's a very strange question to ask, isn't it? In the context of art, proof is a rather odd thing to look at. Yet in the world of science, oh, it's everything. Right? I'm willing to bet if I were to walk in here and I were to tell you, I have a lab the students could do in five minutes. And they will completely understand string theory. I hope you can see it. Right? Well, what's been the first thing that would be in your mind is not coming out of your mouth. Okay, prove it. Right? In science, that makes total sense to ask. All the time, right? In the world of art, it doesn't make any sense to ask at all. Art over here, science over here. They're very different levels. And so when some people think about PDR, they tend to move towards the art of teaching, but that's not the PDR. PDR is the science of teaching. What else makes them different? Another good example is this. In the sciences, we're very interested in replicatable results. You run an experiment over here, we better get the same results over here, right? But think about the world of art. Okay, we have the Mona Lisa. All right, I'll take 100 of them. Are they worth as much as the original? No. But in the world of science, if you do Michael's and Morley over here, we better get the same results over here. Hopefully, you don't start seeing it, right? In the end, when you write a you want to see the same results. In the world of art, well, maybe it's not so hot, right? The world of art is very different from the world of science. The EO is fundamentally built to science of teaching. In other words, the research results we get them to be replicatable. We want them to be able to reach the same conclusion, whether they are done here in Texas, or maybe even back in the old lab in 
science of it. And it's not so easy to do. In fact, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. Okay? So let's talk about some of the myths of PER. Because there's a lot of them out there. We'll talk about the myth versus reality. Okay? The first myth. Oh, well, PER came out of education research. Not at all, actually. In fact, you could trace some of the earliest articles in PER back, well, easily 100 years ago. In fact, if you start looking in journals like AJP, things like that, throughout the years, you will actually see articles coming out quite a lot of times in PER. But beyond that, you might say the explosion happened back in the 70s. That's where a lot of people kind of trace the modern era of PER really starting up. And it came out of physicists who are teaching classes and they're saying, I feel like my students are not getting it. In other words, I have these wonderful examples. They should get it. I have these great lectures. I've used them for years and they're awesome. And then they realize, well, God, that my students, they're not quite clicking with them. One of the uh, big names that really helped this exploding go is our lecture. This was his revelation. There's another one that's just out there, a story I always like to tell. His name's Eric Mazur. He's at Harvard, a uh, physics professor up there. And there was one day somebody showed up to his office and they said, okay, I've got a bunch of these multiple choice physics questions, basic introductory level mechanics. Will you please give them to your students and see how they're doing? And he looked at him and he goes, oh, these are too simple. Come on. I mean, this is ridiculous. It'd be insulting to give these questions to them. They're that easy. By the way, the questions are known as the four concept inventory, the MCI for short. It's one of the most widely used assessments out there for introductory intent. In fact, they use it worldwide at this point. There's data from all over the place. And as it turns out, yes, they are very simple looking. In fact, as a physicist, Sarah used to say, how can you like me be wrong? It's so obvious what the answers are. And so what he did, he walked into his classroom and he said, all right, go for it. I know you, I know everyone's going to hate this. And you know what he found when he actually graded them? <laughs> they bombed. They bombed horribly. It was an awakening moment for him. He went, oh my gosh, they can't answer these very simple questions. And what, what happened afterwards is he started to move into the world of PBR himself. In fact, he's actually come up with one of the bigger forms we'll talk about in just a bit called peer instruction. And so it's one of these high moments that we've had now for decades. This is because our physicists have been recognizing that yeah, we have an issue here. We need to address it. We need to figure out how to do it better. Is plastic lecture lab the best way to do it? Maybe, maybe not. In many ways, it depends on how. Right? We'll talk about that in a bit as well. So that's the first myth is that it did not come out of education. It actually came out of physics. Physicists were so worried about this. They did some game studies. And at the heart of PER is this very disciplined research approach. And I would argue that part of the reason why we have that tradition is because it was physicists who started looking into it in the first place. The one thing we are trained to be is good researchers. We are trained to take a very careful, disciplined approach to the research. But we took that expertise and we applied it to the field of how to teach physics, how do students learn physics, how do they process this stuff. Myth number two. PR is not a real science. I've kind of touched on that already, right? We shoot for replicatable results. We are shooting for our data. It's not good enough to say, oh, I developed this lab and it worked great in my class. Well, first thing I'm going to ask is, okay, well, that's great, but what does that mean for everybody else? And if you tell me, well, it's going to work in everybody else's class, then you know what I'm going to say? Prove it. Right? Prove it. And it turns out in PER, we have a whole plethora of very carefully developed research methodology. In fact, it takes years to get fully trained and even a good chunk of them. I spent a good portion of my time as a PhD student just learning how to do them. Because it's not something that you can slot dash throw together real quick and say, okay, I got these results. Well, saying to quickly throw something together and just cry it out in the classroom, but do you think it will ever get published in an actual research journal? No. No chance. Not a chance at all. The folks who are overseeing those journals, the editors, the peer reviewers, they're looking for hard data. They're not looking for, oh, this seemed to work great. That won't cut it. That won't cut it at all. 
Okay. Talk a bit about PER, but I do want to throw out the third one. So this is the one that's probably one of the biggest out there in my experience at least. PER only works for those who are in PER. In other words, you've developed this amazing way to approach your teaching. And it works great for your students, but it can never work for mine. Well, it kills me when I hear that. Because as it turns out, one of the main goals of PER is trying to develop something that is replicatable. That just won't work in my room, but that will work in yours as well. As long as you follow what I say, the instructions here, whoops, spin on it here and there, but as long as you follow the method, it should work. And if it doesn't, then my research is flawed. There's something wrong with this one, right? So PDR is not just for those who are in PDR. It's meant for all students and instructors. It really is. In fact, we'll give you an example of this. There's one particular uh, report that's out there that has really exploded over the last several years. It's known as the studio learning environment. David mentioned that just a bit earlier. Imagine walking to a classroom completely different from this. Imagine walking into a classroom that looks like a lab. In fact, I taught in one of these facilities at NC State, and when a lot of people think about a lab, you think, okay, you can hold, what, 20, 30 students? That's not going to cut it at a big four year. Well, our room held nearly 100 students. A lab was that big. The students worked at large round tables in teams. The class time was focused on students working together on various activities. In other words, they're using a physics I'm just hearing about. I'll talk a bit more later on about why that's so powerful. Okay. So this notion of the studio classroom, it's been out there for a while now. Uh, and in fact, it's spreading. To give you an idea how far it's gone, that's where it's at in the U.S. This is the latest map I pulled up just a little bit ago. You saw that's where it's at in the U.S. so far. In fact, Lee College is right about there. So, yeah, we're on the map too. Now, where is it worldwide? Oh, it's there. It's putting me on the U.S. map. In fact, my, one of my research advisors at NC State, Robert Beekman, he was the one who originally conceived of how do we take this idea of the studio classroom and scale it up to a big four year university? By the way, I'll give you forever. This is his acronym, scale up, scaling up this idea. Well, it actually stands for Student Centered Active Learning Environment for Undergraduate Program. But he couldn't resist the uh, acronym there, right? So the idea is you're scaling it up to the big four year, and he has traveled through, well, multiple places now. In fact, he's been one of those who's been spreading the word, showing them how to do it. While I was at NC State, he spent a lot of time in Australia and in China. Uh, they're really beginning to ramp up there now. Uh, it's beginning to spread more and more than South America, and as you can see, it's already established a foothold in Europe. Uh, it's a worldwide movement at this point. And at Lee College, it's one of the things that we've been doing. It's actually converted over not only our business room, I'm also, because of my engineering background, I'm also teaching engineering courses, and yeah, I'm learning about my studio lab. You want engineers to learn hands on, right? I mean, that's point about it. I'm teaching them like that. Uh, beyond that, we've got my own. There now. One of our tenants is We've got folks already converting over in mathematics. This is spreading even beyond physics. More and more people are becoming interested in class. It's a little bit over when I saw this. They actually had a comparative literature class in the room. I thought that was a very interesting idea. It's spreading even well beyond science. It's worldwide movement. This was beyond just those in PBR. In fact, many of these places are not used. Posts. These are folks who are in other areas, other research areas, and looking for them. More and more results are pouring in, and they continuously show that this type of environment is vastly superior uh, to what we're seeing in standard lecture lab environment. Yeah. Do you repeat what environment is? Sure. Uh, so imagine a large room. In fact, this wouldn't be too bad if we got rid of all the tables. Imagine large round tables. Believe it or not, Bob Bigner says that's the most important piece of technology in the room. He actually calls it a piece of technology. The reason why is because when you're sitting at a round table, you're facing your other teammates. This, uh, he says, enhances the group interaction. That's critical. He 
because you're spending most of your time in class working in teams, on activities, discovering the physics, using the physics, applying the physics, you want to enhance the collaboration as much as you can. So they're at these large round tables. The bulk of the class time is really spent on lab, on experiments, both simulation based, hands on based, sometimes problem solving. Right? It's a variety of activities that you do. Now, with that being said, there are some instructors who tend to find a balance. Maybe they lecture some and they do activities. And there are others, like Bob, who says, no, you got to go a whole bear. you got to do as much as you can. Maybe do a little talk in here and there. But you want the students mainly using the physics and hearing about it. I'm somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. Uh, I like to move more towards Bob's then than I every year. And more and more activities, and I'm getting closer to that. Let me give you an example. Uh, in my introductory mechanics course, turns out my students, I don't tell them up front, these are Newton's three laws. Memorize them, love them, get ready to use them all the time. No, I don't say that. They actually work through the lab where they get the ideas first. Now, that's a big difference from me telling them the ideas. They discover them first because you know what happens? It becomes their ideas now, not just mine. They have ownership of it. They tend to believe themselves more than they believe. Not exactly their knowledge, but it's true. Right? They're buying into those ideas. Now, I don't have to convince them anymore. They've already convinced themselves. My gosh, I have this part that has a lot of mass on it. It's this part that has very little mass on it. And look at that. The force probes are telling me if we get the same size force, it's incredible. I can just shock them all. So. And so they these ideas before I even say what they are. Now, after they've had a chance to use them for a little while, I'll just sweep in and you know, swoop in and say, okay, these have names, all right? They are actually known as Newton's laws. This is the first cause. And that looks familiar. We've been using that for a while. Oh, that's the second one. Yeah, you guys just are with that one. Oh, yeah, here's the third law. No big deal because you already know this, right? Now it's no surprise. It's obvious, right? These are ideas that they've already been working with. So that's how I flip the idea of uh, conveying something to the students on a test. I'm not now the information giver necessarily. The students are discovering it. I just use them afterwards to say, here's the actual thing. Here's what else they're known as. Okay? So that's a taste of the studio environment. It's hands down one of the most flexible teaching environments I've ever been in. It is amazing. Uh, and I have been, like I said, a professor. You can do lecture in there if you want. You won't the full impact of the results coming out of that, but you can do it. Or you can just go crazy and go 100% activities if you want to. Uh, the reason we do accommodate that. Part of the reason why I love it is that flexibility. It allows me to move with where my class is taking me. Because right? that's the other thing. You do real What's happening during class? Normally, when you're given a lecture, what are we doing? Some body language, maybe? We're getting some questions in, we're getting a feel for, okay, are they blocking in or not, right? But in the studio room, they're wanting to do the activity, so they know what that means. They actually have to explain the reasoning to their other teammates. Just this listening while they're explaining the reasoning, right? I don't have to pull it out of them. They do it naturally. They have to collaborate. They have to talk to each other. It's the only way to get through the activity. So, of course, I get a free ride by listening in on what they're actually thinking. That allows me to do real time adjustments. Oh my gosh, you're going off the rails with this idea. Okay, we need to do some more activities along that line of thinking back. Maximizing the impact of every second of the talk. It is something extraordinary to think. Do your remarks apply to also uh, teaching in the high school level or not? They have done something which I won't say it's exactly the same. Uh, it's in the same thing. It's called modeling. The modeling approach, the idea is this. They still work in teams, and there is a great deal of active learning going on. And what the students are tasked with doing, it's actually not a bad idea, is they're looking at the situation, experimental results. And they're developing a model for it. For example, they have a model for motion that is for a constant acceleration. They have to develop a model around that. What are the experimental results telling me about how this velocity relates to the position or to the acceleration, so on and so forth. They start to build these models for various situations. And once they build those, then they go back to the class as a whole. They circle up in a large circle without, right? And by the end of it, if the instructor is still enough, they make sure that the end of it, the model has a model, right? And so as the 
class goes on, they build more and more models. This idea feeds into something else that I'll, I'll talk about in just a second. But yes, there is some movement at the high school. I will admit, though, that much of the research at PER yeah, has been self centered, focused on the university level and the college level, uh, particularly at the introductory courses. In a way, you might say, oh, that's the biggest thing for your butt, at least for the most students there. But it is in this culpable up and down. Uh, you're seeing more and more research coming out at more advanced undergraduate courses, and some are even pushing into the graduate level as, as well. So we're getting there. We are, we are working our way up. Okay. Uh, so by understanding how the brain processes information, the question is, what can we do? I mean, once you know how the brain works, how can you leverage that to your right? Well, in the end, you can make this processing information quite easy or very difficult, right? And of course, in our class, we don't make it easy. We want to have the information flow quite easily. So let me give you an example of this. I'm going to ask you to do another very simple thing. It's not hard, I promise. What you're going to see in a moment here is a slide that has a bunch of words on it. Now, these words are going to be shown in different colored fonts. So some are red, green, blue, whatever it is. So you may have to work with the person next to you, assuming you get along. All right? So if you're sitting next to somebody you want to work with, you might see yourself. Now, here's the way it's going to work. I'm going to show you that slide in just a moment. And as quickly as you can, I want you to identify all of the font colors as fast as you can. I'm willing to bet you can do it pretty quickly, not a hard question. After that, I'm going to show you a slightly different slide. One, one minor change you may find interesting. So, uh, you may have one person timing you, and perhaps the other, and they can check you to make sure you are staying in the right color, right? And the other person will try to run through the list as quick as they can, okay? Here we go. So, and action. Try to refill as quick as you can. All right. Does that have it? Not too hard, was it? Very easy task, right? Notice that we are focusing on the color, not the word. I'm going to make one small change, one minor change. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but I'm willing to bet you're going to have to concentrate this a little harder. It's still going to be an easy task, but I'm willing to bet you're going to find this to be a bit more helpful. Here's the minor change. Again, go through it as quick as you can. All right? Here we go. Just tell me what the color of the font is. A little bit tough for me. Yeah, first time someone threw this out of me, I was thinking, oh, I can do that. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, green? No, no, that's purple. I was like, what? No, red. <laughs> and yeah, you can kind of find yourself stumbling through it a little bit. Well, I'm giving you distractors, right? What I'm, what I'm causing to happen to you is what's known as higher cognitive load. In other words, I'm making your brain having to disentangle the information in the words from you reaching the color. And it causes you to have a higher cognitive load. What do we want to do in our class? We want to reduce that cognitive load. We want to make it easier for that information to flow. We don't want to increase it. We want to get the students focused on what we want them to focus on as opposed to getting distracted by other stuff in there. By the way, this is no do you want to check it out. It's the R double It's another famous one. So how can we use this to inform our instruction? Let me take you to some of my favorite results. These are the ones that I personally use the most. There's a lot of PER results that are out there. These are some of the ones that have impacted me personally the most. Top of the list. This goes back to the idea of language, believe it or not. Here's the idea behind this approach. Research tends to show us that if you expose a student to the same material several times, you can sink in deeper, right? And so what this does is it takes advantage of that by doing just that. It spirals through the material multiple times. So let me give you an example of this. And the one I'm going to talk about is for the calculus of physics. This is the one the engineers take, the future physicists take, basically the future means, the future you, right? This course, what they do is they sweep through different ways of modeling the universe. This is 
is actually kind of a good thing. You want a physicist to be able to model and understand how to model the universe. Can I use this very simple model that has all of these approximations? Or do I have to use this base of a model that doesn't approximate so much? Right? That's a skill you want all physicists and engineers to have. Right? This leverages that. That's probably why I love teaching this for that course. Model one, what it does, the first sweep through the material, and it goes through the whole sequence, the standard introductory mechanics course. It starts off with a particle model, first off, so you don't have things like rotational motion, things like that. It starts off with constant acceleration, constant forces, and motion in only one dimension. Fairly simple model, right? Of course, a lot of assumptions are going into that. But it's a very simple model to start discovering this language, just understanding how physicists talk. And it cycles all the way through. So you're hitting the language, and then you follow it up with applications. So now that you understand what I'm saying, let's now use it to solve problems, right? So you sweep through it once, then you get to model two. You take it up a notch. Instead of motion in one dimension, let's go to two and three dimensions of motion. We're still keeping the particle approximation. We're going to hang on to that. We'll still hang on to constant acceleration, constant forces, but now we're taking it up to multiple dimensions. Okay, second sweep through. The students have now twice. They're getting a bit more familiar to it, so we're going to take it up a notch at model three. Now we get rid of the whole notion of constant forces and constant acceleration. Well, now we're interested in calculus, right? Now you start getting into the calculus. But at this point, they've seen the material now three times. So yes, you're adding in the complicated calculus. It's not a minor one, right? One of my favorite stories that I, I remember from a couple years is I had some engineering students in my lab, and they were struggling to do this integral. They were integrating over V, and they just could not do it. And I said, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm thinking the whole time, I'm looking at this going, it's not that hard. Uh, it was a very simple interval, and they were stuck. And I said, all right, well, what will happen if you take all the V's out and you place them back in? And they wrote that down, like, oh, okay, there it is. <laughs> and the same interval. <laughs> and yet that one minor change made all the difference in the world, right? And so, in the end, that's a big jump to then apply what you learn in calculus to the world of physics. Yet, at this point in the semester, they've already seen it now for twice before, and I think we're time. You're beginning to lower that cognitive fluid as you go, right? Now, model four. So let's get rid of that particle motion, right? Now you get into rotational motion, both sides of the spectrum, right? Now, over time, you gradually remove your approximation, and you get closer and closer. It's not so real, but you're, you're maintaining cognitive loading at a reasonable level. You're not throwing all at them at once. You're gradually keeping them on in. Right? Spiral probes. Love it. By the way, that's the best part. Part is free. You go to that website and download everything that this person developed for absolute free. Complete curriculum, just wait man for it. Uh, other one, active learning method. Now, this thing's big. Uh, I already mentioned that I teach the studio learning environment, and I love it. I hate to go back. Uh, so, this. This is built on using these methods. For example, inquiry based. I mentioned that a little bit earlier, how my students discover new laws first, and then I sweep it afterwards. I feel, by the way, to have me, right? But they see it first before I do. It's now their idea, not mine. Uh, other examples, mission modeling already, discourse management, taking some ideas from modeling, but then ramping it up to the university level. Now, clickers. When most people come to me, I have taught in a traditional years, and that's what I'm used to. This is what I've done for a while. But I would like to at least start doing something a little different. I want to at least dip my toes in the water of uh, using some of these methodologies. This is usually what I recommend. This is usually one of the most gentle ways to ease yourself into the pool, if you will, right? Clicker. The idea is this. Students have a bunch of, or you might call them remote controls. They have a bunch of buttons on them. Periodically, you ask them multiple choice questions, and you ask them to respond. Now, at your computer, you've got a receiver of some sort, and it accepts all of their responses. And you can get on the spot at Instagram. So, what do they all pick? They have to choose A, B, whatever it is, right? But it goes beyond that. Because when most people think of using clickers, well, that's kind of where they stop. And they say, oh, okay, so I am not using a form method. Uh, not quite. You're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, there are some specific methodologies that you can use with that that will give you a punch. Your 
Fear Instructions 1. That's Eric Missouri's idea. Uh, there's a whole book out there. In fact, you Google Fear Instructions, I'll probably be one of the first things that I can get to. Uh, he actually lays out his specific method on how he uses the clickers, and he did achieve significant replicatable results. We've seen it elsewhere as, as well. It wasn't just in the class. Now, if you want to take it up a notch, this one does require a bit more time on the instructor's part. Just as I am teaching. Yet another very powerful reform, but yeah, that one's a little more hefty. Uh, now you're not just a so when you got your whole leg in the water. So it's a little bit, bit more hefty. And then for those who are so inspired, you just want to dive on in, just go nuts. Yeah, there it is. In your learning environment. That's the full blown implementation of just about everything you can imagine. We fell out. This really unleashes the horror, if you will. The downside, of course, is that you gotta get out of the standard lecture environment. In fact, funny, funny story. Um, what okay, I, I was talking with, with Bob Wiener one day, and he said, you know, the first time he tried to do this scale up idea, add these things, well, they didn't have a large library available. And he said, well, you know, we got these lecture halls, let's just try it. You know, well, why is it in there? See how well it works. Oh, by the way, I have to go on sabbatical. So he called in his buddy, John Ripley, to run it. He managed to convince him. I, to this day, I don't know how he did. But he said, John, please cover me for a semester. And John said, okay, sure. We'll try it out. He's a nice guy. So he did it. He said it was the worst semester he's ever taught in his entire life. It was the hardest thing. Because the problem is this. Imagine the students working in teams, and now I need to get to that team right there. Well, I said, okay, hold it. I'm moving over. Okay, now I'm in. You know, that's a little distraction for everybody else. No. Oh, he said it was terrible. That's why Bob quickly afterwards said, okay, we're never running it much at all again. It doesn't work in there. You have to have a big lab environment and that feels good around. It was real easy. Because in the end, the instructor, ooh, you can check the side. He's teaching in one of those. You don't, you don't stick around for very long. Now, some of the students may say, well, let's, you know, the instructor never does any work. We're going to have to do all the learning. I'm like, yeah, exactly. We can't do all the things. Absolutely. But what they don't know is that, oh, yeah, my mind's always going because I'm planning. Based on what they're saying and based on what they're doing, I'm playing it out. Oh, by the way, the other thing Bob Beaker recommended, this is something I would get a kick out of. He says, yeah, that's one thing he's doing, he's listening, but you know what else he does? He starts arguing. He swoops in on his team and says, well, have you thought about blank and then just leave? And all of a sudden, plan all of you to use your argument later on. He loves doing that, but that's how you get them thinking, right? You get them considering things that they may have not considered possible. Power of that learn. Yeah. How do you use clickers? Well, let me give you an example with this, okay? Uh, one of the aspects of your instruction is this. So I pose a question to the class, and everybody answers it. And let's say you don't all agree on the answer. In fact, you know, I love it when my students disagree. I think that's awesome. It's an opportunity. Because then what you do is you say, all right, turn to the person next to you. Battle it out. What did they put? Convince them that you're right. Or they better convince you that they're right. But in the end, prove it. Right? Now they're having to fight it out. But they're listening to other viewpoints they have not had before. And what's really interesting, in my experience, when you use methods like this, they have kind of converged on the right answer. There's not a lot of other coaching I have to do. That's one piece of your instruction, is that in class, the has a huge database of clickers. In fact, he gives you, on if you buy his book, he'll give you a nice database, get you going. By the way, there's many others out there. If you want to know where they're at, feel free to send me an email. I'm more than happy to, to tell you. And he throws them out periodically. Yeah, he'll, he'll talk for a little bit, throw out some ideas, and then he sets back and wants to class that all the time. What's the just in time? Just in time teaching uses some of the ideas from your instruction except Irreversible the order. I'll give you an example. So the students, before they come to class, you've told them you need to read this part of the book. Now we all know how well that works, right? Okay. Uh, what you do differently, though, is you say, okay, first thing you do is before you come to class, this is what we do before class even begins, usually an hour or two before, you go on to the online homework system and you got to take this pretest, right? Now, what's the, now, what does that do? Well, it does give the students some incentive to actually do the reading. Okay? And you make the questions reasonable so that if they've done the reading, they should be able to say. But here's the other thing. An hour before class, the students got the responses in. Now the instructor logs in, and he 
take a look. Where do they struggle? Where? Well, right? Now you walk in the class fully loaded and ready to go. Now you know how to direct your class, customize it to fit where they are struggling, to fit where they are struggling. It makes your class even more powerful. Okay? And so they walk in and now, I'm done for you, having answered some questions. What do you do in class? Well, you start addressing some of the problems that you see. One of the ways you can do it is again in They actually do integrate a lot of these techniques during the lecture time, except in a way they kind of reverse the order. You may have heard of flipped classrooms. This was kind of a beginning of that, actually, where you have your lectures recorded and you then load them onto maybe a course website. The students watch the lectures and then they come to class after watching the lectures and then you have them use the ideas that were in the lectures in the first part. Yeah. By the way, Bob Beaker is beginning to look at that more and more carefully. He calls the Millie Project because yet another fit of shirts. There was an NSF grant out there called the Leader Grant, and he called it Millie. Millie's the leader, another really bad acronym. Uh, he, he couldn't resist, but that's the idea. He made his lectures in short, like 10 to 15 minutes. So it's almost like watching a podcast in a way, right? So the students watch this over the course of a day or two, they come into class, and then Instead of them doing more lecture, you don't do that. They start working on labs. They start working on experiments, on activities. So in a way, he's kind of using the student environment, but in a slightly different fashion. And you're seeing more and more people beginning to explore this as well. It's not just Bob Dylan. They call it a flipped classroom. And you're seeing this even outside of the ER. There are other disciplines who are becoming involved in Any other questions? Have you seen anything positive on the Sure. Absolutely. Um, the clicker, imagine a TV remote, but it doesn't have as many buttons on it, fewer buttons in many cases. Although some of them, they're getting pretty, uh, to say advanced. Uh, I've seen some that were 20 to 50 button clickers. Mine have six buttons, right? So one of the power buttons turn it on, and then the other five labeled A, B, C, D, E, right? So you power it up, and then I throw out a multiple choice question on the board, and then you hit your, your answer on the clicker, it's transmitted to my computer. My computer now receives the clickers coming in from the entire class and it can tabulate them for me on the spot. So when I'm ready, I say, okay, got all the votes in, boom, let's take a look. And then we split the classes back. And personally, I love five, right? 50 50 ties. Okay, I'll narrow it down to A or B. Now fight it out. Turn to your team and figure out which is it. Of course, when they have, you know, the five branches, A, B, C, D, and E, yell, be mean, and say, yell, there, I've done one day. Go ahead and fight it out. And then they all run on to all things. But that's just part of the fun, right? Uh, and in many cases, like I said, it's uh, you really do see them start to converge, actually, on the right answer. There's a couple of times where I have to go look at that, and, you know, I don't show this to my students, but I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, all right, we really went off the rails there. So then I have to figure out how am I going to swerve them back off. But that doesn't happen very often, actually. They're, they're usually pretty good at self-directing. Uh, every once in a while, I may have to give them a little food for thought, but it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, we are not. That's all I have. Thanks for having me out tonight. I appreciate it. I want to make a comment. When I went to college, this German guy gave us our first business like this. In thick English, he said, he said, forget everything you learned in high school because we're going to disprove everything. And that sets us all off because we had worked so hard to learn that in high school physics. And of course, during the course of three years, they did. <laughs> I just want to point that out. There are real challenges there, especially with the pressure they're under with our testing and went on all the standardized testing. I actually interact a lot with high school physics teachers. And yeah, they're under unbelievable threat with that going on. Especially now that this is required for everyone. So now they are literally having to teach every single student passing through and they're trying to figure out how am I going to do this. And so yeah, I absolutely agree. There are real challenges there. Especially when the state's telling you, you have this amount of time to cover this stuff. In fact, in some cases, it's gotten so bad, they've even said, and this is the lesson plan that you will follow. Not being a Woo! Yeah, I would be. Uh, and so, yeah, there, there's real challenges there. I, in many ways, I'm grateful I'm at the college. Uh, we have a lot of great. Well, 
when I was in college, we had a lab. Is there still a lab called with the, the model? Or is this lecture and lab combined now? In my case, they, they come together. The area is very gray. It's no longer a discrete. You will show up the lab for three hours on this day of the week. Right. And then hopefully the lecture will kind of have something sort of to what you're doing in the lab. And mine is absolutely integrated all together. So I can smoothly transition from one to another. I mean, you know, like I said, the example is flawed. You know, in many cases, they, you're introduced to them in the lecture, and then maybe in the lab you do some sort of verification something along those lines, right? In my case, it's exactly opposite because I have the freedom to do that. They're in my lab, if you will, already. So I can do those activities up the top. And then I can do that. What age range do you have in your class? Well, given that I'm at a community college, my age range is very broad. I have taught folks who are nearing retirement from folks who are still in high school and they're taking for the dual enrollment. And I will have them in the exact same class. What kind of uh, conclusions do you draw about the ability to educate younger versus older? Do you see any correlation between age and ability to solve product of problems or understand material? Let me preface what I'm about to say with the following, because we all are scientists here. I don't have any hard data to back this up. All right. So all I can give you is strict speculation and my own impression. Okay. Um, based on what I the older students I have, they tend to be very focused. I'm in the class now. I actually do want to be there in the And if you give me an assignment to do, it will get done. I will have it ready to go for you, and it's due. Some of my younger students, uh, they will come in and have a high school environment, and in some cases, the states that we're in today. They will be shocked. That my gosh, he actually does not only give me homework, but he gives me a lot of it. I actually do require a lot of work coming in every week. Um, and I tell him up front, oh, I'm ruthless. I don't let up. If you miss getting your homework in this week, oh, we're going to have a lunch to do by the time you get on next week. And it's just going to get worse from there. I'm ruthless. I don't, get, I don't back off on any of that. And many of them are surprised right, when they come in by how much I'm throwing at them. Um, and so, those students, you really, you know, I, my experience, I think I have to push a bit harder, you know, to keep them going. Now, there's one thing I try. I don't have any hard data on it yet, but the results are interesting enough that I'm going to continue trying in the short term. In a conceptual physics class I taught recently, one of the things that I tried to do, so I was getting a lot of the students going in there who were the less. And they would have real issues in staying on top of the work. So I began to think, how can I turn this around? And in a way, using their own perceptions against them, right? And so one of the things I just started trying out with this, I would say, all right, this handout represents all the problems I'm going to want you to do for this week. Now, at the end of the week, or actually in that case, it's at the beginning of every week, you're going to have a homework quiz on that. Or I'm going to take some of those questions, load them into, we use WebCT. Load them into WebCT, and you're only going to have about, I think I gave you 15 minutes to do them at the beginning of that day's class. Not a lot of time. And I made sure it was enough questions where if you didn't do them ahead of time, you didn't have a prayer if you don't finish it very well. Right? And so what would happen? They'd enter, they'd get, their, they'd, they'd get it graded right there on the spot, and they would see what, what they got. In any case, they were not happy with it. Because, again, if you don't do it ahead of time, you're probably not going to do well in that's what I then told them. I said, okay, you got a chance to fix this. By the next class, turn in the complete worked out assignment. Not just the problems you saw with PD, but everything. I want them all in. By the way, I'm a big uh, proponent of reasoning. In other words, I want to see your reasoning. Just don't give me a final answer. Okay? Yeah, I care about it, but I care a lot about your reasoning. I have to get there. So, when you turn in the work, I'm expecting fully written out solution on um, this. So, we went, oh, so a day went by. So they had their quiz. In many cases, they weren't satisfied. They started turning in written work because they're like, well, I don't like how I do the quiz. Can I fix it? I'm like, sure, just turn in everything by the next class. So they started turning it in. And it was a really interesting transformation because it went from, oh, I have to do 
do this, to, oh, thank goodness he's allowing me to do this. I thought it was a really interesting transition. Manipulation. Uh, I was trying to turn it around on him. And so, uh, like I said, I don't have any hard data on it right now. It really isn't a research project, but uh, in any case, the results were promising enough. I'm beginning to at least pilot this in some other places. Sounds like maybe a dose of this one. I've got, you know, I made some comments and I'd like to, or made some notes and I'd like to get just one more comment and then I'll show it up. Uh, my perceptions were uh, colored just what I was expecting tonight, a little bit different, but that's fine with it. Um, you know, I think of physics is uh, in neuroscience requiring a, a big balance between right, uh, your, your abstract. Uh, physics to me is very abstract, almost artistic, uh, big time right brain and left brain at the same time, highly analytical. And so I wonder about the maturity of college age kids. Are they really able to concentrate and focus and bring the abstract with the analytical together, be able to really work problems, solve problems, and be able to explain the unknown? Uh, cognitive load distractions, and development of the prefrontal cortex, uh, especially with young people that's not there, uh, that comes along in your 20s. So uh, any teaching methods that can accelerate, I, I don't know if any of your, any of your background is in, in the, you know, the actual neuroscience of the brain. I, I, I have had some background in it, but that being said, I'm not a neuroscientist, right. but I've had some training. Would any of these people talk about in, uh, research or education in those terms? Absolutely. In okay. fact, one of the uh, classic uh, frameworks, although it's a little bit outdated to some of these days, is known as J. You have heard of the developmental stages of beings as they go through various parts of their life. And there has been some research that suggests, just as you said, that when they're even at college age, they haven't necessarily progressed all the way through yet. Now, with all that being said, there is research out there that I um, mentioned on the previous slide that does show when you give assessments to these groups that are predominantly, well, actually, I've seen them both, a bit more quantitative as well as sexual, although admittedly, most of the research is sexual realm in terms of can you apply the ideas do you understand what they mean as opposed to computation. And those results do suggest that there are reforms out there that can make a pretty big difference. Uh, let me give you an example of this. Uh, research shows that if you're in a traditional lecture hall environment, you've got lab on the side and you're teaching, then you can expect what's known as a normal change on the fourth concept inventory, the FCI, of about 0.25. Now, let me tell you what that means. Let's say the students walk in and they know, let's call it 10% of the FCI. So, so they, they, they score about that much on the pre-test, right? That means that of the entire set of material covered in the FCI, that means they could conceivably learn the rest of the 90%, right? Now, the normalized learning gain gives you a gauge of, well, how much of that 90% did they actually get, right? So if we're talking a gain of about 0.25, well, we didn't move that far in, we'll move a little bit. Now, let me give you a feel for what we have found in studio learning environments, okay? Uh, we blew them out of the water. Uh, there have been average learning gains uh, in the range of about 0.45 to 0.5. In other words, about double what we're seeing out of, out of a traditional lecture hall. So, we have 100% now. I wish we're not there yet, but uh, there, are, there are certainly big gains you can get out of some of these other methods. But there, I can't remember his gains off the top of my head with peer instruction, but I do remember that they were significantly above the baseline, which is about 0.25. Uh, that's, uh, that's out there. In fact, there is uh, classic paper from the late 90s done by Haig, where what he did is he went around to the various conferences that were going on, research conferences, and he would just ask, hey, do you have the FBI data for me? I'd love to get it from you. And people started doing that. And he collected this huge database. We're talking over 6,000 students worth of FBI data, which in the world of PDR is massive. It's one of the largest data sets that you got out there. 
And he collected all the stuff the idea. And then he asked the question, are you using any of these methodologies or not? Are you more of a traditional or are you trying to do yourself? Active engagement. Well, he found out that the baseline, where I'm getting the baseline from, was about 0.25. For the interactive engagement, it was closer to 0.45 to 0.5. Personally, in my classes, yeah, I even beat that. My, my classes tend to run even higher than that national average baseline. I think I have some advantages with a small class size. I, I do have a very deep background in GDR. I know these reforms inside and out. Uh, but with that being said, again, it works for folks who are not a PDR either. You know, it, it, some of these methods are quite tough, and I would fully expect you to see a difference. But, yeah. I was wondering, when you do get up to the level like we just mentioned, how does you know, that's a great question. I've not seen your research results at that level. Um, that would be a very interesting research project. Actually, in fact, the activities developed for advanced class, for advanced you know, in the graduate level. So I would love to see that get along the line, but I have not seen much. Now, there is some work going on there. Again, I mentioned that earlier, but it's not nearly as extensive as what you see at the introductory level, because, like they said, I think that's the biggest thing. But it's definitely a lot of focus. Is there a one method? No, I haven't heard that. Um, I have a, I would say, policy here to do that. way that works is you go in the first day of class, and in the context of it, all you have is a set of axioms, a list of theorems. And the rule for the class was if you prove the theorem again, you can get it to possibly a good school. And there was no lecture. You just start from there, and every day you would walk in. I would not recommend it. <laughs> not easy to do. 
but I have done that in short span. Uh, but yes, uh, if you do run the larger scale up style sizes, it is strongly recommended that you at least have a few graduate assistants in there also circulating around. And of course, you want them properly trained as well, because teaching in there is teaching just about anywhere else. So you do send them through a training program, get them ready for it, and then you unleash them. And instead of teaching separate labs, well, they're in there with you. And, you know, as a lead instructor, because I, I do teach in there as a lead instructor as well, it's kind of nice, actually, because if they're doing something that I kind of want them to modify, I can kind of lean over and say, okay, watch out for this and that and the other. And then we can do minor corrections as we go as well. So in a way, I'm kind of operating at multiple levels. I'm watching my undergrad students, but I'm also kind of keeping an eye on my graduate students as well. Yeah. And I was real lucky, though, because the place I was at had a very strong CER group. So guess who I went to and I was ready to be the instructor? I was at the CER group and said, anybody want to be graduate assistant? Hey, I love around. So I was actually going to bring in CER which it helps on but, but that being said, not be your residents can do just as well. They just have to go through some training to get them ready for it. That's, that's not the other side. I have a comment. I didn't know if you this is the best of thing I love the most, but I want to make a comment. I think there's no field in human endeavor or a field of study that is undergoing a bigger revolution. The Higgs boson is you know, part of it, but there's just so much that's going on that's changing, and the whole landscape is completely different. Yeah, you know, dark energy, dark energy, you name know. Very so cool time. It, it couldn't come at a better time because yeah. it's going to be hard to teach something that's constantly changing. You know, what's very cool, especially let's say the Higgs boson, for example, I had so many students come out of nowhere. Some of them here weren't even my physics class saying, Can you tell me about it? I'm like, I love this. Normally I have to go out and say, Hey, you want to hear some physics? Surely my engineering students could do 
it. I mean, that's nothing. Give this to the engineer, and they were stuck. And he went, oh, my gosh. I've got conceptual students solving these problems that my engineers can. Okay, we've got a problem here, right? And it, it woke them up. And now Minnesota is like, I mean, just a stronghold of a lot of the great problem solving research that's been done across the board in the business program. Pretty much, if you want to teach there, you have to buy into these methods because it convinced them wholeheartedly. Once they saw this huge difference happening. In fact, I believe it's there. They're building a new, a brand new building. It's going to have, I want to say, 10 scale up rooms in it. I think it'll be the largest facility of its type in the country. Actually, it, it shocked me when, when I heard there, because Auburn itself is running a lot in a lot of different areas, but I think Minnesota may end up taking the case for the largest amount of shooting rooms out there. All right. Um, let's, uh, it's not with the global questions, but um, uh, I think our speaker is going to still be around a little bit. We'll ask you those questions afterwards. So let's thank our speaker. Anybody who is uh, fighting graduates, um, the deadline for applying for graduates is next week, I think it's the 28th of February. So it's early in the semester. So if you want to graduate, you just fill that out. And also, grad students have to pick around the time. Yeah, uh, grad students taking the capstone class. Yeah. Uh, 